evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to uh, yet another of the SMDP webinar series. We're really happy to uh, have you here today. Um, hopefully everyone got the message about the time zone issues. Um, we, we just came over to daylight savings time here and somehow we had our webinar set on Canadian uh, maritime time. So um, hopefully if you're listening to me, you got the message. Otherwise, this will be recorded. So we'll send out a message for everybody to let you know that the recording will be put up uh, later on. So today uh, we're going to be talking specifically about uh, a book that just came out. It was actually just unveiled uh, at the SEEP annual meeting back in November, uh, Savings Group at the Frontier. We have some uh, really great guests, uh, friends, and uh, authors who um, I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, but before we go uh, into the webinar, I did want to make a couple of quick announcements just to let you know about some upcoming things that are going on. Um, first of all, as I said, we will be recording this and um, on the SNDP webinar page, you can find the listing of future webinars, which I'll tell you about in a minute, and also um, there will be uh, this recording and related links, which we'll tell you about later on. Um, our next upcoming webinar is going to be uh, Wednesday, May 15th. Uh, this is the second in a series that we've done with the uh, Microcredit Summit, the State of the Microcredit Summit Report on Vulnerability. This will be in French, so it's going to be Vulnerabilité with Fanta Wolde Michael. He's the uh, Executive Director of Maine Microfinance Africa Institutions Network. Um, joining us from Addis Ababa. He is actually a partner with SMDP on work that we do. Just finished a program with Hugh Allen in um, Lome, Togo, and uh, working with us on some other great projects. We also have Gauthier uh, Dillon from Chemon La Vie Bio, uh, from Jose, Haiti. Um, Gauthier is going to be uh, talking specifically about um, programs that um, they're doing at Pont Jose to reach the very poorest. And also Luisa Bernori. Luisa is a professor at the University of Bologna and she's actually written part of the uh, microcredit summit report. This is going to be entirely in French. Um, the report in French actually will be posted on the website so you can download it. And um, so um, please, uh, for all of you that are French, French speakers, uh, please pass this on. I will be uh, promoting it through microcredit summit and through uh, SMDP. But um, we would like to have as much participation as possible. In June, uh, we are having the SMDP New Hampshire Certificate, June 17th to 28th, here in Durham, New Hampshire. Um, registration is going to be opening in a few days for that, and we're really excited uh, to have um, among the, the guests uh, during this will be Jeff Ash, who I'll introduce in a minute. Um, we also will try something unique, which is going to be uh, having a webinar within a classroom within a certificate program. <laughs> um, kind of like those uh, Russian dolls, you know, one nested in, in, in each. But we're going to uh, be having a day uh, devoted to social enterprise, and we're going to be inviting Drew Tolchin, um, who is with uh, Social Enterprise Associates, I believe, and also a gentleman named Greg Van Kirk, who is Community Enterprise Solutions, talking about micro-franchising. So we'll tell you more about that in the future, but just put that on your calendar. And then later on um, this year, we'll be having a webinar focused on gender and Development in Microfinance with Linda Jones, who's most recently with the Cody Institute up in Antigonish, and uh, Chuck Waterfield will be talking about uh, specifically about microfinance transparency and some of the work that he's been doing to um, educate um, practitioners in the field about uh, microfinance interest rates. So we're really excited to, to be able to continue doing real high quality webinars um, for the next several months ahead and really appreciate your participation in them. And remember that you can always listen to them later on. Uh, as they're all recorded and you can actually see and hear them as if uh, you were participating in real time and just can't ask questions. Speaking of asking questions, this is also going to be a, a somewhat unique webinar in that we will um, be, as usual, allowing you to ask questions. So if you're looking at your little navigation bar from GoToWebinar, there is a box where you can type in questions. But you're typing in questions, I'm going to be, as usual, previewing these questions, but what we'll do differently this time is that I'll let you know privately that I've read your question and that you can ask your question directly to the presenter and I'll open up your mic. I'll let you know that I'm opening your mic and you can actually talk. Um, so if you want to ask a question and use the mic, then please make sure your mic is connected and um, we'll, this will be an experiment. Never done this before, but we'll have an opportunity to see um, if you can directly have an exchange with our panelists um, and with me through this wonderful technology. 
Um, it might not work, but hey, it's worth a try. So uh, without further ado, what I want to do is just quickly introduce our panelists uh, today. Um, we're really happy uh, to have with us, first of all, Candace Nelson, who is an accomplished writer, trainer, curriculum designer, researcher, grants manager, conference organizer. Um, <laughs> and um, Candace is actually uh, the editor of the book, Savings Groups at the Frontier. Um, so we're really pleased to have uh, Candace uh, be able to join us today. Um, she's also uh, the uh, co-editor um, of the Microfinance Handbook that just came out from the World Bank. Um, excellent publication, which you might do a webinar on later on as well, and that's uh, available for download for free from the World Bank site. Um, so Candace, welcome, glad you're here. Thank you. Um, next we have Jeff Ash, um, director, former director of community finance, Oxford America, now independent savings group consultant. Um, Jeff uh, and I have, uh, have a long association going back to 1992, the first time we met. Um, we were involved in a great social and financial experiment called Working Capital back in the 90s, along with our friend uh, Kim Wilson. And um, so Jeff um, will be telling us more about the future of the savings group movement and, and the future of Jeff Ash later on, but we're really happy to have Jeff and his wealth of experience and his leadership that he's, he's been able to uh, show th through the entire uh, 10 or 12 years of, of the uh, most recent savings group movement. So welcome, Jeff. And finally, um, Kim Wilson. Kim is a lecturer at the Fletcher School and a fellow with the Center for Emerging Market Enterprises and the Feinstein International Center at Tufts University. Um, Kim has been a, a noted writer, uh, thinker, speaker, um, and uh, someone who, um, along with Jeff and Candace, uh, had an important role in putting together the Arusha Savings Group Summit back in November, uh, October of uh, 19, uh, 2011, uh, which this book is a product of. Um, so welcome, Kim. Glad to have you here. Thank you. So uh, let's get to it. Um, we, um, I want to give a tiny bit of background in that uh, in um, 2011, we were all engaged in putting together the first global summit of savings group practitioners that uh, was ever convened. And uh, this occurred in Arusha, Tanzania. We had more than 260 savings group practi practitioners from 51 countries attend. Um, it really was a seminal event for um, the savings group movement. Um, it was the second in a series. There had been an earlier conference that uh, Kim had organized at Tufts back in, I think, 2009. And uh, there was most recently a savings group um, conference in Washington, which I'm going to actually have Jeff talk more about later. But this process of um, meeting in, in Arusha in a very intense agenda, an agenda that included um, a fair amount of um, uh, interchange and, and small group discussions and uh, forums between uh, all the practitioners resulted in some really important ideas being uh, discussed. So what I wanted to start with was to ask Candace, um, how, how were the frontier in issues in the book selected from the wide range of topics that we discussed at the summit? Um, you probably would have liked to have covered more topics in the book, but why did you settle on the particular uh, topics that ended up in this book. How are they frontier issues? Well, um, in some ways, I'm embarrassed to say that we selected these topics before the summit, uh, <laughs> as opposed to in reaction to discussions that took place at the summit. And the reason we did that is um, that by knowing their topics ahead of time, the authors committed themselves to interviewing people at the summit, interviewing practitioners who were there um, about their topics so that they could use that, incorporate that information into their chapter. Uh, and, and the point of that, obviously, is that this gathering was unique in its fact that it was located in Africa, drew primarily from field, field people, you know, people who were on the ground running savings groups in dozens of African countries. So we really wanted to tap into that. We wanted to be prepared to tap into that um, experience, broad experience. So we picked the topics ahead of time. And they really were, um, if you look at the six chapters, uh, they cover kind of the broad outlines of what we know about savings groups, or what we knew about savings groups at that time. Um, a, Joanna Ledgerwood and Elisa Jathani's first chapter did a really good job, I think, of placing savings groups within the financial ecosystem, um, encouraging all of us to look at them not as just this 
kind of cool thing that happens in the informal sector um, that that is off by itself as a, as a unique little intervention, but rather as savings groups and other in, informal sector services are really part and parcel of a broader financial ecosystem. And they make that case quite eloquently in that chapter. Um, we wanted to profile the membership, which um, Susan Johnson does. And, and Paul Ridley's chapter they wrote with Hugh Allen really gets at the nitty-gritty core of what makes savings groups tick. It's how, how, are the, how do you form them? How do you train them? How do you instill a locally-based uh, expertise that can, that can provide ongoing technical assistance to savings groups once the initial external facilitating agency has left the area? And they go into all the sort of ways in which our thinking about this has evolved and practice has evolved since the early days of savings groups in the 90s. Um, we then have a chapter that synthesizes everything that was known at the time about impact. And, and um, that author, Megan Gash, reviewed, I think, 14 different impact studies on savings groups and present, presented this sort of the synthesis of that knowledge. Um, and then there's been an extraordinary level of, I think, sophisticated work on performance monitoring. Um, so there's a chapter that sort of reviews what is available to practitioners, and the kinds of systems that they can plug into um, to join a global community of savings groups practitioners in monitoring and collecting data all in the same way on savings groups. So, so those are kind of, I think, the big topics. There's so many we could talk about, as you note, the the conference agenda back in 2011 was very diverse. We couldn't write about everything, but we picked those things that we felt were, you know, the broad themes that influence and drive a program forward or a movement forward. So it sounds like this is a book that's really it's aimed at practitioners, and it's very there's a lot of very practical information that can be useful in in how programs are designed and how programs are operated. But um, it's also gives people who are interested in learning about the savings group movement. Uh, a fairly good background of, of Oh yeah, I think if you read this book, and it's really not very long, it's six chapters by six different authors, so you can kind of you can kind of pick and choose and you can read it read a chapter at a time at, at your leisure. But I think the the book as a whole kind of is it does a pretty good job, I think, of bringing anyone who's interested in savings groups up to date as to what what this movement's all about and what the issues are that are um, shaping its future. So I wanted to bring up the, the kind of process that went into putting this book together. Um, beyond the topics, you uh, decided to use the, a similar um, method that David Rubman used um, in the, his uh, book, Due Diligence, which is essentially an um, open book process of posting chapters online before they're finalized and then allowing people to um, give feedback kind of as an iterative process as it went through. Went, went along before the book was actually uh, published. Um, how did that work out? And, and is, you know, did you get some really good um, suggestions? Um, I know your time frame was shorter, and and um, you know, it was not exactly the, what David Rubin did, since you had multiple authors. But you know, how did you feel about the process? Was it useful? Would you do it again? That's a good question. We were absolutely inspired by David Rubin. In fact, um, the idea to follow his example came from. Uh, uh, I think Paul Rippey at one of our planning meetings proposed this and we all just jumped on it and said, oh, that's so great. Um, so we, we started with high ambition and I think reality set in along the way. Um, we did try to do an open process. So each, each author, and there are six authors, um, committed themselves to uh, putting, to posting for public digestion, public review, the outline of their chapter, and then uh, the first draft of their chapter, and so, and I think maybe even a second draft, so that so that there were two or three opportunities for you know, 350 people who attended the conference, plus lots of others, anybody else who who knew about this, to um, comment on on the very early outline of the chapter and early drafts of the chapter. The limitations that we ran into were that um, you know, with six authors, we I couldn't get everybody to commit themselves to be available to keep reviewing and revising their chapters over the course of a year. We had a we had to work within a, a shorter time period, and so um, the comment period at each stage was a couple of weeks, and I believe for David Rubin it was much longer. 
Yeah, um, and so I think that probably limited how much, how many comments we got. We had a very loyal following of people who diligently read, you know, every outlining, every draft chapter and commented. And each, if you, the book actually notes all the names of the people who commented on each chapter. Um, but the truth is that it was a, a fairly small and consistent following of people who were really interested in, in the shape that this book was taking. And they, they followed it and they participated in the way that we intended, but it wasn't hundreds of people. It was yeah. dozens. But it was useful. I think so. I mean, I think so. I think that because of that, there's a greater ownership of the book. It's not just, oh, this, you know, Candace edited this book by a bunch of people. It, we all, there's a big, huge group of practitioners who know these authors, who met them at the conference, who had a chance to read their draft chapters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I do think that, that, that there's a, a, a broader ownership of the book as a result. Well, I, I wanted to point out uh, a couple ways that I, I think, you know, this participatory process um, rolls on, it, you know, is kind of a, the, one of the um, hallmarks of the way in which the summit was organized. And part of that is really through the savings-led working group of SEEP um, and also um, something that Kim has been instrumental in putting together with Paul Rippey, savingsrevolution.org. I just want to encourage uh, listeners who are interested in savings groups issues that these are two resources that are very valuable on the most current information going on with savings groups. And we will post links to both the Savings Led Working Group and to Savings Revolution uh, up on the website along with a recording uh, for this. Um, and I just wanted, speaking of Paul Rippey, I wanted to mention that the slideshow that you're actually seeing, if you're um, viewing your screen here, are slides that were contributed by uh, participants in, this, in the uh, Arusha Savings Group Summit, contributed from all over the world, looking at savings groups from Tajikistan to Guatemala to South Africa to um, uh, Burundi. Really exciting, really beautiful pictures. So that'll be our, our background if, if you wanted to know what you were seeing there. Um, I also want to encourage people to ask questions as we go along here. Um, if your question seems to fit right in, then I will um, let you know we're going to open your mic and you can actually ask our panelists the question directly. So feel free to ask questions as we go along. Candice, I just have one more question uh, specifically for you. Um, in the book, Megan uh, Gash gives an overview of a number of different research initiatives that are being carried out or recently concluded by several facilitating agencies, including CARE, CRS, Oxfam, and IRC. Uh, the results of these studies are really, I think, can be helpful and very interesting to organizations who are considering uh, involvement in savings group promotion or, or doing savings group work right now and would like to learn more uh, from what was gleaned from the research. Um, are there any plans to compile the studies into one publication, um, giving practitioners access to all the findings in one place? Uh, no, actually not currently, but there is um, an, an, another activity going on currently that um, I think will will further advance our understanding of the impact of savings groups. And that is something that um, wasn't included in the book because the studies that, um, re that it entails were not completed at the time that Megan wrote her chapter for the book. Um, the savings group movement is in a really interesting place and I think a very unique uh, place because a number of years ago, the Gates Foundation made a significant investment in savings groups that included sizable grants to three practitioner organizations, Oxfam America, CARE, and Catholic Relief Services. And those grants each included money to carry out random control trials at savings groups. And we are now at a point where all those studies are uh, have been completed or are about to be completed. And that's a pretty interesting thing, to have um, a very rigorous methodology applied to the same kind of program, the same kind of methodology in multiple countries. So what SEEP is doing now is we, we have a little uh, grant from Gates to do a synthesis piece of the random control trial findings. And that will include uh, findings from seven studies. Uh, and that is... In the, in the works right now, I think we'll probably have a draft in the summer and a final publication in the fall. Great. So that, that's um, what will be compiled together and then I imagine the individual organizations that we're doing the research might have their own view on um, putting together their own publications and things, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Bill, I know you should go ahead and ask other people questions, but there was a question on your list for me that I want to answer at some point. So can you come back to me after you've gone What was the question? I thought I asked all the questions. <laughs> uh, it was, what, are the, what topics did we not cover in the book? Oh, yes, so, I kind of said I that in the beginning. I want to address that, but I don't have to do it now. Oh, uh, no, go ahead. What, what topics uh, could you have covered that you didn't? <laughs> okay. Well, just really briefly, I would say that um, it, if we, if there's a weakness in the book or if there's something I would do differently, I would spend a little bit more time charting a course for the future. I think we really touched on very well the issues that are shaping the movement and driving it forward, but I, I'm not sure we spent enough time envisioning where this movement is going um, and forecasting what, what's going to happen. And, and, and some of the things that I've learned since we wrote the book are that um, there's a lot of agencies, a lot of organizations have embraced savings groups and are, are piloting savings group programs who are not financial agencies at all. And mm. I'm thinking specifically of um, a, a bunch of very large programs operating in various countries in Africa that are funded by the PEPFAR office out of USAID. And they have embraced savings groups as their preferred um, model for economic empowerment for households that are infected and affected by HIV AIDS. And whereas we, I think, all have said all along, oh, the savings group model is a great model that spans a wide range of economic, socioeconomic profiles, these agencies are really honing in on how to make savings groups effective for highly vulnerable populations. And that's going to be really interesting to watch where that goes. And I don't think we really talked about that enough or forecasted that enough. And I think we're finding that um, there are really interesting things being learned right now about how to uh, build savings cultures for youth. And, and there are a number of programs that are experimenting with a bunch of different ways to do that, from formal, specially designed bank accounts and formal institutions to savings groups. And so far, the programs I've looked at, savings groups are by far and away the winner in terms of the number of youth that they can draw to participate in a savings activity. Um, and I'm pretty convinced after having looked at these programs that if you want to build a savings culture for youth, you do it through a combination of financial education and savings groups, um, as opposed to formal savings accounts and banks or MFIs. So, so I just think there's a lot of things that I've learned in the year and a half since we wrote this book that I wish I had known back when we wrote it, I would have put them in. So there can be a savings group at the Frontier Part 2. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, it's just, and I'm sure Jeff and Kim will echo this, but this is a movement that is uh, evolving very quickly. As more people uh, figure it out and get excited, as excited about savings groups as we are, and, and start working with them and applying them and integrating them in a, into their programs, we're seeing them go in places that we didn't project a couple of years ago. That's very uh, exciting. And it's exciting. Well, so. I, at the near the end of the uh, the uh, webinar, as part of Jeff's um, comments, I would like him to talk about the future from his perspective. But what I want to do is we actually have um, we're going to try our first experiment with a question um, we have from Nether the Netherlands. Bob Bragger is going to ask a question uh, to the panelists. So let's see if this works, Bob. Bob, can you hear me? This is like a call-in talk show where the caller's not there anymore. Maybe Bob's microphone isn't working. OK. We can hear Bob. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to actually ask Bob's question. This is the fun thing about technology. So what Bob has asked is um, he wants to know what has uh, been the biggest obstacle to the formation of savings groups? What, what um, you know, why aren't we at the 50 million savings group members at this point? Um, and, you know, what, what can we do about that? And any of the three of you could answer this question, but what, what's the biggest obstacle to growth? Jeff, I think you should answer that question. Well, good. I think that's a uh, that's a, a perfect segue. Um, the 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 greatest obstacle is is uh, at at this point is is uh, sufficient funding to, to accomplish this. 
what we've been able to achieve over these years is develop a, a, a very effective technology for doing this. The systems and the manuals have been fine-tuned. We have organizational capacity, uh, which is growing by leaps and bounds uh, all over the world to accomplish this. Uh, I think with a very modest amount of, of funding, um, this movement could grow uh, tremendously. I'll be commenting a little bit more about this on the vision statement uh, later, later on for the field, but uh, I think we truly have the potential of being significant players and increasing uh, uh, financial inclusion worldwide through this mechanism in a way that's uh, far less expensive and, uh, and easier and, uh, than, than the other approaches that have been tried. It's truly a grassroots, uh, bottom-up kind of approach. Well, that actually is a, a great segue to um, the areas where I wanted to, to ask Kim. Um, you know, Candace had just talked about how there's a whole new set of players that are getting involved in using savings group methodology for um, as part of the work that they do. And in the chapter of the book that you wrote, you discuss the ways that savings groups add value to their members' lives uh, in addition to the financial benefits. Uh, and you talked about uh, Paul Rippey and Ben Fowler's uh, paper, Beyond Financial Services, a synthesis on, on studies of integration of savings groups and other development activities. Um, and you highlighted this whole debate, uh, which has been going on in microfinance for 25 years, about the minimalist approach of just basically providing financial services or a more integrated model of program operation. Um, so in your estimation, Kim, um, do you, I, there, you know, there's obviously dangers and trade-offs between different models of, of bringing in other activities, but um, I, I guess I'm, I'm curious about specifically what you talked about in um, the group members. I mean, we know group members have to buy into and they have to be supportive of whatever that other activity is, but you had actually talked about taking it a step further of having them be kind of the authors of uh, and creators of the direction for you know, beyond the basic uh, uh, savings and lending that goes on to delve into new areas, to explore new uses for their savings groups that they could actually have um, a role in that or be the, the, uh, the drivers of that. Can you talk a little bit more about that concept and, and have you been able to see that in action anywhere? Sure, Bill. I, I think um, just to start with an anecdote that, that uh, we wrote about in the book, and uh, I came upon a man in Kenya who had, um, had been trained in the VSLA methodology and um, did not work for an NGO. Um, he was a librarian. And that's what he did by day. And by night, he would go into Kibera, which he was originally from, which is a slum in Nairobi, and uh, work with local clubs. Um, social clubs, so there, it might be a men's club or a neighborhood club, and say to them, as a true activist would, look, we can, I can really help you mobilize interest and, uh, and trust among your members um, if you follow a few simple techniques. So he would go out and um, maybe 20, 30 clubs were under his wings that had transformed essentially into savings groups. One was huge. Uh, it had uh, over 150 members, and um, they were not all from Kibera. They included people who had left Kibera. And so the question was, how could those members stay in touch, you know, stay tethered to their mother club in Kibera? And his solution was to use M-Pesa. Um, and they were able to figure out a very simple method of uh, creating a group account, which wasn't really legal or recognized then. And um, four, the four of the officers each memorized a different number in the PIN code. And that way, they could assure that somebody wasn't going to run off and, and hijack the money. And so, so he very creatively used technology in order to keep his membership intact. This is in just one club, and that was called the Gatlakura <coughs> Railway Club. So, so here's somebody that took the model and ran with it didn't have to be part of an NGO or a project, um, and made it his own. Very, very inspiring person. And uh, since then, I've been able to see a number of other examples where people have 
managed to um, not only be a savings group member, but to form other uh, groups and to bring in the kind of services that they want and they need versus the kind that we think they should have. Uh, but as anybody listening can probably imagine, this is hugely challenging because it requires a very flexible agency that's promoting this to work with people to co-design their own solutions right in their own village or neighborhood. And that flies in the face of standardization. It flies in the face of log frames where we have to check off, um, you know, we, we created so many groups that are going to help orphans and vulnerable children, or we created so many groups that are going to combat um, HIV and AIDS, et cetera, et cetera. So how that happens, I think, is going to be a challenge. I think it, it, it's, at this point, a vision. Uh, but, but systematizing it is going to be extremely difficult because by its very nature, it's an organic process. So, um, I mean, that's, I think, kind of the fun of where savings groups are going. They're going in 360 degrees in every direction. Is that there are going to be very structured approaches to doing other activities and there are going to be a lot of experimentation and just um, people like Lucas who are just able to go off and, and experiment on their own. And, because the model is inexpensive and because it's pretty easy to replicate, that's going to happen a lot. Um, is there, is there a, f a fear by facilitating agencies that this rogue savings group work is going to somehow um, you know, put a, a, a bad impression on the savings group movement altogether? Or what do you think, Kim? Is, that, is this just part of the, the fun of having an a open source technology out there? Well, I, I don't think it's a fear. I think I think agency would, would agencies would applaud it. Um, I think what happens is the staff that are tasked with organizing these groups feel that they have to accomplish a certain amount of things every single day, and do they really have the liberty and the time to sit down and say, "Look, this is truly about self-help, and you all are able to design your next step." Let's, let's see where this might go. What kinds of services can you pull in? Um, it's, it's not the most efficient use of staff time. So if I'm a, 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 you know, a foot soldier of this and actually being paid or even charging money to provide a certain set of services, they're going to be minimum. Um, or they're, they're going to be minimum or they're going to be shrink-wrapped services that I can easily um, parse out versus uh, a, a process of co-design and co-creation. So I don't, I don't think anybody's against it. I just think that the, the processes we have in place now and uh, are, are conveying against this being a reality anytime soon. It's, it's just a vision. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to see if I can open up the mic um, for another question here. Unfortunately, uh, Bob Mike didn't work and, and we lost them all together. But um, the next question is going to be from uh, Leonard Otiano. Um, Leonard, we're going to try to get you in here to ask your question. Um, this is a question that can be um, to Kim or to uh, Jeff or to Candace, but it's open to everybody. Um, so Leonard, I'm going to see if your mic is open now. And um, can you hear me, Leonard? Leonard, can you speak? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So, Leonard, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you for having this um, presentation and for the other thank you for the work on the book. And the question is related to um, uh, the one that was asked uh, before, uh, the one that was uh, just answered. Uh, um, but I, I was just in, in, in known when the was is lack of adequate financial resources. Does it mean um, resources for mobilization of savings groups, of um, education of uh, people to know how to form savings groups and uh, to emancipate themselves? So exactly what uh, what for what are the priorities? What needs to be done and um, for what? Is, um, Hello. Oh, yes. Keep what going. is the plans uh, inadequate? And another thing uh, I would be interested to know is um, whether the authors identified some 
certain threats or risks to the successful operation of savings groups. Thank you. So were you folks able to hear the question, Lola? The first Please. part I completely missed. I just I hate to say it. Okay. No. I, I'm, I'm with Candace. I couldn't hear. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't hear. Okay, then I'm, I, uh, Leonard, it's okay. I'm going to actually just read the question you asked because there was a little bit of a feedback issue. Um, when you talk about ina inadequate funding as an obstacle, do you mean lack of funding for financial education or for awareness, creation, mobilization? I'm yet to read the book, but would be interesting to know if you identified key threats to success of savings groups. Negative shocks appear to be a factor, for example. So. Well, oh, perhaps I could uh, perhaps I could comment on that on that point. Uh, it's very very interesting. Um, as far as uh, what what struck me is how robust savings groups are. Um, and I I just uh, uh, let's look at the context in Mali uh, in the face of uh, a coup and fa in face of uh, the end of most most of the funding in face of uh, one of the major droughts. Uh, as far as we can tell, virtually all of the groups are still intact. They continue to replicate. Uh, this is what I've been calling the amoeba model of uh, microfinance, there, where each group has within it the genetic material it needs to, uh, uh, to not only to survive but to, to replicate. So at a, at a grassroots uh, level, these groups are, are surviving and, and, uh, and, and replicating uh, along uh, at, at the same time. So robustness, uh, I think, is one of the characteristics of these uh, the groups. The, the failure rate has been extremely low, even under the most dire conditions. So um, actually, I'm going to ask another question um, and not open the mic, um, just for the interest of time here. But uh, this is Winfred uh, Nayongo, who's asking the question, uh, savings groups are no doubt very successful. I've come across some over time that have accumulated a wealth of resources but don't know how to utilize the savings except the normative sharing and managing basic household needs. Yet there is very high potential for them to move into real investments like asset acquisition, improve production, and sustain their future livelihoods. Are there efforts to rethink the future of the savings group model to act as drivers to rural development? Good question. It's a great question. I think, um, Jeff, well, let me just say that I think there has long been um, attention, savings groups are, are capturing and have for a long time captured the attention of a diverse range of development players who see them as um, a source of not only money but organized labor and um, uh, goodwill towards the community to achieve all kinds of things, and Kim referred to some of these. Um, the, the issue of whether we would want to or whether, whether someone would want to look at savings groups as, a, um, as an enterprise, as a group enterprise, or look at their funds as a way to capitalize a group enterprise is um, both an opportunity and a risk. The, the previous question caller, or previous person asked the question about what are the risks to savings groups, and I think this is one of them, is, is there's so many ways in which you can uh, take a savings group, or a savings group can take itself. It can take itself in towards community development activities that it does collectively, it can take, it through invest, take itself towards uh, investment opportunities that it does collectively, and, and as I say, I think all of those present both opportunities and risks. I think we all know what the risks are of group-owned um, and managed enterprises. Did uh, Jeff or Kim have any thoughts on that? Or no? Jeff, I, I, Kim, I concur. Uh, okay. It's a uh, it's a risky undertaking. Go ahead, Kim. Okay, great. Okay. Um, um, I think potentially the question. To, um, sorry, Bill, but I think the question is not just about group enterprises, but um, is there, can people think beyond their daily needs? And um, what I would say is if we want to peek into the future, we should look at um, the self-forming ASCAs uh, that are out there. And mm -hmm. for example, in, in Northeast India in, in Assam, there's villages where people belong to up to 14 different ASCAs um, and the average household belonging up to four. 
and wow. I ask a, I'm essentially talking about a savings group, but but they're they're there are different uses for each one, so um, and they, the meetings happen very, very efficiently. Um, but some are saving long term over five years, say, and before they share out. And some are sharing out every year, um, and some are simply taking money they get from the harvest and putting it just that one time into their ASCA and then borrowing from it until the next year. So, so these variations. Um, are out there. And the, I would say to allow them to, to thrive, maybe what we need to do is not be so prescriptive about our model mm -hmm. so that people really feel licensed to, um, to move beyond it as opposed to, gee, am I doing it right? Am I following all the procedures? Am I, am I uh, you know, going in order the way I'm supposed to? Uh, so we, we've routinized it and that makes it look good and legible from the outside. But are we tamping down innovation and creativity as we do that? That would be a challenge, I would say, that's ahead of us as, as a movement. Right, and I think along with that would be how do we capture what's happening out there so that we learn the lessons and, and get a sense of how people are being creative and innovative and doing something that's you know far from the the the, the mold, um, but are having some success. I think you know we. It's like the tree falling in a forest, nobody hearing it. We don't hear about these great stories. We don't have ways to share it, you know, such as Savings Revolution or, or the Savings like Working Group or other uh, mediums. I think it's really, you know, essential that we, we continuously learn from what's going on out there. So, so Bill, what, what, if I may, if anybody listening would like to email me um, even a short story, uh, I'm delighted to put it up on Savings Revolution. Uh, there you go. So I, I'd be happy to do that, uh, and I'd be happy to give credit to the author of the story. It would be wonderful. Great. Okay. And like I said, I will put the link to savingsrevolution.org up on the website, but here's an offer really for anybody that wants to get your stories out there. Um, we'll, we'll put Kim's email up there as well so that uh, you can contact her and, and discuss the possibility of um, having something. Um, I think I'm going to move on to uh, get Jeff into the conversation a little more here. Um, so Jeff, you uh, just hosted a savings group conference in Washington um, in early March. It was really well attended. Um, and I guess germane to the conversation we've been having, there are a number of organizations who are new to savings groups uh, who are either looking at the methodology or are uh, starting to experiment with it. Um, can you talk a little bit about the goals of the conference? Um, did the conference achieved what you wanted it to, and um, on the second day of the conference, uh, at the end, we did a really great brainstorming World Cafe exercise to set this ambitious goal of 50 million savings group members by the year 2020. Um, is this attainable, and if so, how, how are we going to get there? Good. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, I think the origins of this uh, conference in Washington, D.C. actually began uh, over uh, uh, cappuccino and, uh, and croissants in uh, Concord, Mass, when I was talking to uh, Candace. <laughs> and we were trying to visualize uh, what was, uh, uh, how we were going to spend the last bit of the, the Gates funding that was allotted for conferences. So we came up with two models. One was the practitioner's conference, in, uh, which was uh, held in, the, in Arusha with great success. And the other was seen as uh, a coming out party for savings groups. Uh, it was our opportunity to present to the world uh, what savings groups had accomplished and to try to uh, interest uh, new donors um, and uh, certainly other kind of practitioners, um, not the usual suspects that have been doing this work, but also involve uh, people from agriculture, from health, from literacy, from all sorts of development efforts so that they could incorporate this, this methodology into their, uh, into their, uh, in, into the way that they, uh, that, that they work. So that was the objective. Um, we, uh, we deliberately held the conference in Washington, D.C. to get the absolute maximum uh, participation uh, from all of these as, as opposed to uh, Arusha. Now, as, uh, as you know, over 200 uh, people uh, uh, attended. 
Um, I, I think uh, I, I think we achieved our objectives uh, at least at least partially. I think uh, we were starting a, a process, uh, but I, I think we would have been happier if more from the agriculture, health, and uh, other other fields uh, attended than, than than actually did. I think it was very successful, but I think what we're seeing is this is going to be not a one shot. Uh, one-shot conference, but we're going to have to have more conferences and more outreach to bring in more players into the savings group movement. Um, so, that, um, so that that for the origins and the, and the objectives, I, I think the uh, one of the, this was a tremendous opportunity uh, for us to present the results of the of the random control trial studies, and this was uh, had progressed quite a bit further than uh, than was the case in, in, in Arusha. And particularly, we had the opportunity to get the earliest findings from the Saving for Change uh, random control trial in, uh, in Mali. This is a gigantic study uh, with uh, in 500 villages, half of which were controls, half which were, were not, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, with some 6,000 uh, interviews. And it was complemented by by the research from uh, a group of anthropologists from uh, uh, from the Bureau for of Applied Research in Anthropology, and uh, and uh, it was interesting to see that uh, that uh, the results were were significant, and particularly considering the context of Mali uh, of uh, having a coup in one of the worst droughts uh, uh, over the last uh, decades. Uh, but uh, despite that, uh, we found that, uh, and, and also considering that only 30% of those who were actually uh, uh, eligible to participate, or the, only 30% of the women had actually joined groups. But then comparing those villages that had savings for change with those that did not, we, we saw a, an important uptake in uh, an improvement in food security, which is vital during this conditions of, of drought. We found that uh, much more investment in, in the purchase of animals and the context of, uh, of West Africa, more, uh, more animals are a cushion, uh, uh, are, are a form of savings. Uh, we could call savings on the hook. There was more saving. There was also more savings overall. And I think one of the most interesting findings is that we looked at the profile of who actually joined, that those who were, it was true that those in the slightly better off category were more likely to join these groups. It was also significant that the, the poorest, which you could call the ultra poor, uh, were had joined uh, in in, uh, in in considerable numbers, just a few percentage points less than the slightly better off. And I think this uh, shows uh, a, a highly cost-effective way of, of of reaching the ultra poor, uh, uh, and, and uh, that we can explore in the future. So. Now, Go ahead. go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, so I, I just wanted to see if you would kind of go on. You know, if you're you're going to kind of uh, cast a, a, a shadow towards the future of of where we're going um, with savings groups over the next seven or eight years. Um, you know, what what are the things that you hope to see happen? Well, I, I've been involved in this movement for uh, the last 13 years when I was exposed first to the Women's Empowerment Program in Nepal, and uh, when uh, and also uh, when the, when the movement was in its very very beginning, and it was it was interesting uh, or, or exciting to to hear that uh, Hugh Allen reported uh, just before the conference started that uh, that the Savings Group movement had had grown to seven million uh, uh, group members in some 62 countries. And that of these, over six million were in Africa. And when you consider that uh, the savings group movement, which really has grown very quickly over the last five or six years, from one million to seven million, um, that uh, that uh, that the number of people in savings groups had had exceeded the number in uh, in microfinance institutions in Africa over uh, as reported in in the mix. So the movement is growing very quickly. I, as, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, the the, the methodology for for achieving 
for, for reaching these groups has been increasingly streamlined and simplified, uh, making reference to what Kim was saying about earlier for the for for uh, people uh, going out and forming their own groups. There are now thousands and thousands of volunteers uh, uh, training groups uh, on, on on their own accounts. So we're seeing uh, the expansion through this this mechanism. So we have we have uh, and and the advisory committee. Uh, 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 several of the major practitioners came together, and we established this this objective of reaching 50 million by by 2020. And I think uh, what uh, this movement is coming from virtually being invisible to now becoming visible, we have the potential of uh, of I think we can achieve this objective, uh, and we can achieve it in increasingly more cost effectively as as we simplify the methodology. And emphasize more the uh, the process of volunteers training groups, uh, and as more and more uh, practitioners come online for doing this. So I think this is an achievable uh, objective. It does require some level of funding, but uh, it's it's less than the funding spread over seven or eight years than the amount of uh, grant funding that goes into the microfinance community in a single year. So. I think uh, the challenge is, is waking up the, the donor community uh, to this enormous potential and this, this incredibly cost-effective way of, uh, of expanding uh, financial, uh, uh, financial inclusion. We, we estimated that uh, if we had 50 million uh, uh, group members in place, that the, the groups that they are members of would collectively mobilize some $1.3 billion uh, be managing 1.3 billion dollars in uh, in their group funds, of which about 300 billion dollars would be coming back into the pockets of uh, of very poor people. At the same time, our objective was to in, to link up uh, about 20 percent of these uh, groups to other sources of finance, uh, other financial institutions, and also to link them to other development efforts. So my hope was that uh, in the years to come, we would be seeing a grand alliance between savings groups, maybe reaching uh, in, in far out into the rural areas among the poorest, among uh, with the with the, the microfinance microfinance uh, institutions providing a place to park additional savings, and for individual uh, lo uh, loans and savings accounts and other services, and also mobile money of uh, facilitating all of this. So. My vision uh, by 2020 is to see all three major, uh, uh, the major drivers of financial inclusions working together to reach the, uh, to start to reach the hundreds of millions uh, which uh, lack access to these services. That's great, Jeff. I, I wanted to mention that uh, at the very end of the conference in Washington, Larry Reed, uh, who's the uh, director of the Microcredit Summit Campaign, uh, gave a really excellent um, set of advice, really kind of a, a, a um, looking at the savings group movement in the context of where the, the mainstream microfinance movement uh, has been over the past 15 or 20 years. He gave um, our movement uh, a lot of really uh, useful advice and insights, and I'd uh, encourage people to go to the savingsrevolution.org website and read Larry's remarks because I think they're really useful and they, they really, you know, in some ways resonate with what Jeff has just uh, spelled out for us in terms of a a future for this movement. Um, I also failed to mention um, that anybody who is listening today um, is eligible. Uh, if you haven't bought the book already, Practical a Action Publishing is making it available at a 35% discount. Uh, I have a coupon that I will be uh, sending uh, to those who did uh, actually uh, log in today and listen to the webinar so you can redeem that and get uh, the book if you want to through Practical Action. Um, we do have a comment and um, some other questions that I, I want to get to um, before we uh, wrap up. Um, this is actually, again, from Winfred uh, Nayongo. This is really a, an observation, um, uh, not a question. Uh, she says, I like the issue of innovation and creativity. In our work in agriculture, after we built skills of farmers to do better farming, we were faced with a recurring question. Where do we find the cash to buy improved input? <coughs> hire more land, pay for labor, etc. They were, they were prior involved in VSLAs, but they operated in the normal box 
uh, method. We integrated this as part of the parcel of the agri program as a recommended savings mechanism. The farmers had a focus. On top of the meeting, uh, the household needs, they were able to engage in meaningful production. The BSL is very jealously guarded because of the added value to the farmers and what they find in it. I will at an appropriate point provide a write-up on how this has worked. So that's pretty exciting that this is actually a driver of local agricultural production is what Winford is saying here. And I will put Winford in touch with Kim so she can tell the story on Savings Revolution. Um, Please do. Meg Harris has asked a question, um, could you discuss a little more about how savings groups are being used to serve other means? I'm particularly interested if anyone has examples of how savings groups have been used to help promote local governance structures. So anybody have a, some experience with this? Uh, let me uh, to comment. I was just in Guatemala and El Salvador where I was uh, spent 10 days interviewing uh, promoters and uh, uh, and volunteers uh, uh, for the book I'm writing, another book, yet another book on savings group which I, I, I'm working on right now. And one of the most fascinating cases was an organization called uh, Codemav, the, the Confederation of, uh, of Women in, in Alta Vera Paz in, in, in Guatemala, where actually uh, the, the, the number of uh, savings group members of, of uh, Auro Comunitario, or Save for Change in Guatemala, had grown so quickly that they were able to uh, to develop a slate of candidates, uh, all of whom were savings group members, and uh, and uh, and be able to engineer uh, the election of uh, six uh, Mayan uh, women to to be uh, mayors of, of uh, communities around the Alta Vera Paz uh, area, uh, using this. Uh, Using these groups as, as an organizing base, and to also to convince her husbands and other relatives to to vote for for the star plate, the estrella, the estrella plate. So fascinating example, of which I'm just in the process of writing up. That's great. So so it's actually kind of uh, going alongside the traditional um, kind of governance or or um, tribal um, relationships giving people an opportunity to express themselves in a, in a greater way in some ways. Right. So um, there's, I guess, one more question um, I want to ask, and then I, I think I'm going to wrap up here. Um, we have um, Michael Brand, who is um, from Tendaka. Um, it's a uh, microfinance uh, fund uh, from Cape Town, South Africa. Has a comment, um, Tembeka is working to convince our stock sale movements to provide Tembeka with surplus funds, which we guarantee will go back to the very communities it came from. Currently, their savings go back to the bank and then uses their funds in the first economy with very little interest to the saver and other bank services at all. So the question that he, he is asking is, um, is there a way that stock well, movement fits into the international savings groups movement. Is there a way that stock wells are being um, included in in the kind of um, savings groups models that um, are being promoted by uh, organizations? I know in South Africa there's Save Act, and um, there's also um, uh, another organization I'm trying, I can't remember in Jeffreys Bay that um, is being done. But have you experienced um, stock wells kind of morphing <coughs> over into savings groups or uh, having the two models be able to work um, together? It's a stuff about a, 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 a Rosca. Rosca, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Rosca. I, if I may, I think it's a, it's a really good question, and maybe that's a fourth driver of growth, which is um, looking at what's already out there and um, offering up uh, additional options for, for people. So for example, the Roscos work beautifully in many ways. They're simple, everyone understands them, um, their rewards are easy, <coughs> very, very visible. Um, I've seen in, in Pakistan uh, development organizations starting with Roscos and evolving them into ASCOs um, and, or, or giving people uh, the, the scope to do whatever they want, belong to a Rosca, belong to an ASCO, um, of course, ASCA being what we think of as a savings group. I think it's a great question, and I think we have to be more inclusive. Um, 
I would include the SHG movement in India mm -hmm. as uh, a, a beautiful platform to say, look, you're, you're largely credit-driven now, but with a few tweaks, uh, the, the value of this group um, could be magnified substantially for your membership. Um, so I, potentially conversion and additionality is something that we should look forward to as, as uh, the fourth dimension um, for the future. So I, th I think it's a wonderful question. So again, it's about not being so doctrinaire, about being able to, to um, take the model into new uncharted areas or make alliances or relationships that maybe traditionally we haven't done, which I think is really going to be important. And it's going to happen, no, no matter what, I think. Um, well, great. We're just a little past the top of the hour. Um, I think I'll um, wrap it up. I don't have any um, uh, questions that we haven't already covered the topic. I really appreciate uh, the, the good questions that people have um, brought to the discussion and uh, appreciate the insights of, of uh, Candace and Kim and, and Jeff. Um, as we've said throughout the broadcast, uh, this is really an exciting time for the savings group movement. Um, there's a lot of things happening quickly. Uh, there's a lot of innovation. It's bigger than any of us know about. And um, that 7 million number uh, may be quite a bit larger than, than even what's being recorded in the SAVX right now. So um, we would urge everybody to, to participate in practitioner learning, whether it's the savings Life working group or uh, being able to, to write for the savings revolution blog or or anywhere else where you can get the word out about the work that you're doing or um, ask the questions you need to ask in order to, to do this work better. Um, but we really appreciate the, the level of participation and uh, interest that people have shown, you know, starting back in the original conference back, uh, I think, 2009 at Tufts or 2010, and then uh, continuing all the way through to today. So this is a great movement of, of very creative people, very committed to providing um, accessible financial services to poor people and other activities that uh, make a difference in people's lives. And I just really uh, want to thank again Jeff and Candace and, and Kim for uh, your contribution and for uh, being a part of our uh, webinar today. And I wish everybody a uh, good day and remind you this recording will be available in a few days. Um, because you showed up and because you're, you're listening, as I say, every uh, 90% of life is showing up, so you'll get at least 35% um, from Practical Action Publishing if you want to buy the Savings Group uh, at the Frontier book. And um, there will be future uh, notices coming to you about future uh, SMP webinars, so watch your mailbox. And thank everybody, and everyone have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Thank you, and goodbye. The organizer has ended the session and this call will be dis-